The Woman Who Brought Death by the Prowler Behind the protected castle walls resides the court of Prince Fausto Gomez, a cruel young prince who has been left to rule the affairs of the kingdom while his father is away in some far-off land waging war on a people who they consider less than themselves. The prince, while regal, is ill-tempered and unfit to carry out such a task. His personality and judgment, spoiled by a lifetime of constant catering to his fanciful notions of perceived greatness. The daily mundane business of court, however, has given way to the preparations for the upcoming Blood Moon Festival, or in the kingdom's native tongue, Festival de la Luna de Sangre. While preparations are underway inside the castle, and the prince and his courtiers are carefree, indulging in their royal desires, the outside of the protected castle walls tells a different tale. An unknown sickness sweeps across the surrounding villages and decimates its people, leaving a mass of bodies in its wake across the countryside. Such scenes that have not been witnessed since the time of the Black Death, according to those who survived that horrible plague. Fear has spread rampant throughout the kingdom, for once you catch this mysterious sickness, death quickly follows. An uncontrollable cough takes over, filling the lungs with a thick liquid, making it hard to eat or drink. Then after a short battle with the sickness, your body gives way and slowly bleeds out. While the commoner is left to fend for themselves out in the open amongst the sea of the infected, the heads of all the finest families are secluded and safe, continuing their lavish lifestyles within the safety of the castle. A number of dukes, barons, counts, and earls, most of the kingdom's nobility, in total, reach the safety of Prince Gomez's walls, all but a few anyway, and the few who didn't make it were either killed by the sickness or the people who worked their lands. The kingdom is slowly falling into disorder. Fear and death have taken hold, but tonight the nobility will dine and party. The preparations have been completed, and the great hall is filled with its high-born guests, all dressed in their finest costumes and masks. Each couple announced as they enter the room, going from the least important of nobility to finally the young prince. The party-goers stopped and cheered as Prince Gomez was announced, making sure to overdo their admiration and exuberance for the prince for fear of his temper and his cruel whims. He stood there, taking in the crowd's applause, dressed in the finest purple silk costume, adorned with gold trimming with a golden demon mask. How fitting, for that's what these subjects of his kingdom call him, commoner and highborn alike. El Principe Demonio translated to the demon prince. He looked out towards the people of his court and smirked, waving his hand with a dismissing gesture, signaling everyone to go back about their business. He then made his way towards his seat at the head of the great table that was constructed in the back of the room. He moved throughout the crowd, holding his hand up in a non-subtle way, to cover the mouth and nose openings of his mask, also moving about the room, avoiding touching or speaking to anyone. The prince may be arrogant and cruel, but he is not stupid, especially when it comes to self-preservation. He may have been downplaying the sickness that was sweeping across his kingdom 
to anyone who brought it up to him, and even passed laws and made decrees prohibiting his court from speaking about the sickness in a panicked or frightened tone. But inside he was frightened, frightened that members of his court were carrying the sickness on their person, like deceased carrier pigeons bringing the demise of his reign. As he continued towards his seat at the head of the table, he noticed in the corner of his eye a young beauty, brunette hair, in a turquoise dress. He stood but for a moment to stare at the compact beauty, a woman who was a mystery to him, for he had never laid eyes on her before. Still mesmerized as he finally took his seat, he leaned over to his right and asked one of the few confidants he had in his court, the Duke of Madrid, Esteban Cortez, who that beautiful mystery woman was. The Duke believed the young woman was the daughter of a French count who held ancestral lands on the coastal region of the kingdom. The count and his daughter were said to only spend time at their coastal manor to escape the harsh French winters, and the count's young daughter was never allowed to attend court. That's why you have never laid eyes on her before, my prince, the duke reported humbly. The prince sat and took everything the duke just told him in. When he looked down and saw a note placed on the table next to his goblet of wine, he reached for the piece of parchment and broke the seal. His eyes widened with anger and fear as he read the lines. Tonight your reign of tyranny will end. Your cruelty and depravity has grown tiresome, and your subjects will no longer stand for the crimes you constantly commit towards them. Tonight's party shall be your last, my prince. At the stroke of midnight, you will be assassinated. The prince crumpled the note in his hand and surveyed the room, looking if someone was acting strangely or casting a mischievous stare in his direction. But all he saw was the costume lords and ladies of his court eating, drinking, laughing, and having a good time. He then reached for his goblet of wine and took a sip, swashing it in his mouth only for a moment before spitting it out and dropping the goblet to the ground. What if the wine was poisoned? He dreadfully thought. Everyone stopped and stared at the prince as the goblet made from pure gold clanked loudly off the stone floor. With a panicked look across his face, he grabbed his cupbearer by the arm and told him to refill his cup, ordering him to taste it first to make sure it was safe. The prince then gave a wave to his hand, telling everyone that everything was fine and to go about their enjoyment. He then gave a smug laugh and said it was just a matter of bad grapes. The lords and ladies let out a laugh, once the prince did, and went back to what they were doing. The prince took a proper drink of wine this time to help clear his throat, then leaned over to the Duke of Madrid and placed the crumpled note before him. Who was near this seat before I sat down? Did you see anyone or know anything of this treasonous piece of parchment I place before you, the prince whispered angrily. The duke reached for the note and read its contents, try not to tremble as he did. His eyes widened in shock as he read each line. He then leaned towards the prince. There was no one I saw, my liege, just the household staff preparing the table for the party. This letter, however, is treasonous, my prince and precautions must be taken to ensure your safety, the duke whispered concerningly. The prince ordered Duke Cortez to handle it as he saw fit, but to do it quietly. Hide some extra guards around us in costume, but don't let it be known something is going on. I don't want the guests to be worried, 
and I mustn't be made to look weak in front of everyone either. The prince then went on with his merriment, telling the closest servant to bring out the food. As he sat and looked out amongst his dancing guests, he saw the captivating beauty once more, moving in and out of the dancing couples towards her seat at the end of the table. The prince took another sip of wine and moved towards the mystery woman. He tapped her on the shoulder and said, Hello. Her eyes widened as he began to introduce himself. She bowed her head and said, I know who you are, my prince. The prince, in his most suave and smugly of tones, said, No, my dear. No need to bow before me. Such a beautiful creature as yourself deserves to come sit at the head of the table with me. Let the lower lords and ladies occupy these seats. He reached for her hand, and when she placed it in his, he escorted her to the chair next to his own. The rest of the lords and ladies couldn't help but stare at the head of the table, wondering who this young woman was. Whispers and murmurs began to move about the crowd, searching for her origin. As the prince took his seat, the food was being laid out by the servants. A bountiful feast consisting of boar, beef, pheasant, chicken, turkey, and venison, the finest meats the kingdom has to offer. Accompanied by the freshest seafood from the shores, along with the ripest of vegetables and fruits, finished by the freshest baked breads, pies, and desserts. After the food was served, the prince clapped his hands, and out came the dinner's entertainment. Dancers and jugglers, a theater troupe, and then came out the fool, the longtime court jester. He began to traipse around the table, making the nobles laugh, including the prince, who loved to ridicule the old jester as part of his cruel enjoyment. The jester stood in front of the long table, right in front of the cruel prince, and began to prance and dance, tripping and falling. The crowd was in complete laughter. The jester had never done so well before, but as he picked himself up, he let out her horrendous cough as he stood upright. The laughter turned to complete silence, and the smiling faces replaced with looks of complete dread. The jester then fell to his knees, extending his arms, begging for mercy from the prince. Any hope of such fanciful notions evaporated when blood started to trickle from the jester's mouth. Then someone from the table screamed, My God! He has the markings from the sickness on his neck! He's infected! The prince stood up and screamed for the guards, Get this infected fool out of here now! Use the tips of your spears to keep him at a distance! Nobody touch him, for whoever does will be disposed of as well! he said threateningly. The crowd stood back as the old jester was escorted from the party, afraid to catch the sickness that had now infiltrated the castle walls. The prince, internally frightened and now completely paranoid, ordered anyone who had been in contact with the jester to be thrown out of the castle or disposed of. And when he says disposed of, he means murdered and setting the body on fire, which he had been ordering the Duke of Madrid and his men to do in secret for weeks now. That was the prince's solution to fighting this virus. But whoever showed symptoms to the sword and burn away the evidence, and it didn't matter the social status of the person in question either, everyone at the party was now frightened, not knowing who, if anyone, was sick around them? The prince, who was frightened himself, did not want a panic of his inner circle to incur. Plus, he needed to maintain an image of toughness and authority. So he ordered everyone in the room to disrobe, to show they didn't bear the markings from the virus. Then he ordered the room to be completely sealed until the guards swept through the castle 
disposing of anyone who showed signs of sickness. As the doors closed and the lords and ladies were now protected, the prince rose once again from his chair. We are now safe, lords and ladies, of this most regal court. We have nothing to fear for the rest of the night. Let the wine flow and the festival continue. So your prince commands. He parked to the most smuggest of tones, lined with debauchery. The music started up again, and the wine began to flow, and for whatever reason, be it the close brush with death, or the unseen doom that lurked beyond the castle walls, the party had now turned into an orgy of debauchery. The lords and ladies drank and danced, some still without clothes, from when they were ordered to remove them earlier. The prince remained seated with his mystery woman. He leaned over to her and said, In all this chaos and confusion, my dear, I've realized I haven't asked you your name. My name is Elisabetta, my prince. Elisabetta Renault, she answered humbly. Of course, I should have known a creature such as yourself would have an equally beautiful name. He smiled at her, then turned to his plate and took a large bite from the boar's leg that sat before him. He then took a drink from his goblet of wine to clear his throat, then began to ask her another question. As he was mid-sentence, however, something caught his eye. It was a man still in his costume, dressed in all black, with a long flowing purple and black cloak, and wearing a skeleton mask. The prince felt an unease about the cloaked man, but his concentration was broken by Elisabetta asking what he was about to ask her. Yes, I'm sorry, my dear. I was going to ask you if you'd like to join me in my private chambers, so we could talk and get to know each other better in private, away from this music and these loud people, he asked suavely, as he pointed towards a door just to the left of where they were seated. She grinned and nodded her head, yes, sheepishly. He grabbed her by the hand and led her past the dancing flesh of their fellow guests and into his chambers. He noticed the cloaked man standing in the corner of the room, but his mind was preoccupied with Elisabetta. Once inside, they sat on the edge of his large purple satin sheet bed. He poured her a cup of wine, and they continued to talk. The prince was almost entranced as he looked upon her beauty as she spoke. Surrounded by the glow from the candles, she spoke of her childhood escaping the harsh French winters at her family's manor on the coast, and what court was like back in France, how the lords and ladies there compared to here. As she continued, however, the prince interrupted her. I've been meaning to ask, where exactly is your manor on the coast, my dear? I know of every noble family who has a manor along the coast, especially since I've had to displace a few and burn them to the ground because of this virus. But I must say, I'm not familiar with your family's ancestral location, he said inquisitively. She smiled. But you do know my family's location, my prince, she said as she unbuttoned the top of her corset. The prince's eyes widened with lust. He then leaned forward and kissed her neck caressing her shoulders as he started to pull her dress down. He quickly stopped, however, as his eyes narrowed in on the back of her head. She had her hair up, and towards the bottom of the hairline, he could see some markings through the hair on her scalp. Elisabetta whispered, Renault is my mother's last name. You know my family better by my father's name. Montague. <laughs> the prince's eyes widened in fear as he fell to the floor. You, 
You should be dead. I ordered your entire household to be disposed of, and your manor burned. You're all infected. The prince exclaimed in shock. She stood over him and screamed. Because of your orders, my mother is dead. My entire household is dead. People we considered family. And yes, I should be dead too. But me and father were able to escape when the fire raged. Just then the clock rang out. It was midnight. Elisabetta began to laugh and remind the frightened prince of the note. The prince started to slowly back away from Elisabetta, on his hands and knees, begging for his life. His cries, however, were interrupted by the screams of his guests in the other room. Just then the door to his chamber swung open, and in staggered his loyal henchman, the Duke of Madrid. The Duke fell at the feet of the prince, a knife sticking out from his stomach, and his face covered in blood. He looked at the prince and whispered with his dying breath, He's killing us. He's killing us. Faint moans of pain could be heard from the lords and ladies in the adjoining room. The prince looked upon the body of the duke in horror, then looked back at Elisabetta. She grinned wide, then began to cough, spewing blood all over his face and body. The prince started to scream, knowing he was infected. He then turned and crawled out of his chamber, trying to escape, trying to find water to wash the infected blood off of his face. When he crawled back out into the next room, he saw the unspeakable carnage of the noble members of his court. The bodies of the lords and ladies strewn all over the tables and floor. He quickly tried to get to his feet, so he could flee, but as he did he was greeted by the cloaked man, with a knife to his groin. The man then spun the prince around and wrapped his arm around his neck, holding him in place. The prince stood there, subdued but fading from the pain and blood loss. Elisabetta then came into view. I'd like to introduce you to my father, Count Montague. As she said this, her father took the knife and slashed it across the prince's throat. As the cruel young prince lay dying, Elisabetta and her father, the count, stood over him. She bent down and whispered, I told you, tonight's party would be your last. Your tyranny and cruelty has finally come to an end. I would like to give a heartfelt thank you to the special friends of the channel for your overwhelming generosity. If you would like to support the channel, the link is below in the description. Also, please send me your stories and poems to duchessofdarkness27 at gmail.com. You can also find me on Instagram at duchess.ofdarkness and Twitter at duchessofdark and two. I want to thank all my listeners for your kindness, your encouragement, and your support. It means the world to me. Thank you for joining me. Until next time.